So be careful of what you say. The other members of the team will hear it. Yeah. <laughs> well, now one of the other things, and I guess I should wait till John gets back, is that you know that they do is um, you know have the pictures of everybody either on the all, you know, on mm -hmm. a table for the mass, whatever, which I find really nice too, and. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and you know, more often when they do the prayers of the faithful, they they do mention like priests that have passed away or whatever too, which I find really, you know, so nice to know, you know, because people you never know who knows who. Right. Right. And uh, yeah, usually at the prayers of the faithful, what what we did is if a priest or uh, well if we'd got notice of a priest or religious who died uh we would uh mention them in the prayer of the faithful as well as uh people who have died during the year or during the week and sometimes at request you know anniversaries uh and that sort of thing right but uh Yeah, no, I've done, you know, some of that on occasion, but it's so hard to kind of think about it, like almost daily to mm -hmm. think, oh, I should call the parish and have them put the name in mm -hmm. the, you know, unless you're like there all the time or something. Right. Uh, what I would like to do today, I send out some of those uh, uh, goodies and I, you know, I, in fact, I actually ordered a copy. It's not that easy to get of that Ars Moriendi, which I don't know if that's at any time worth discussing or not, but I would like to today use the opportunity at the beginning of November to uh, go over from start to finish the, uh, the Catholic funeral liturgy. Mm. The, mm. Uh, the the order of Christian funerals is what the current uh, book is called because it uh, there is really something that we might be able to learn from just exactly how the church traditionally might drawing on the on the uh, tradition of how we handle our deceased uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, our deceased family members as members of the Christian family, how we handle their uh, passing in terms of uh, what that can speak to us. There's a, there's a very definite structure and hmm. process to um, how traditionally we as, as Christians going back into the earliest days have reverenced our dead uh, in the in the in the process of burial, and that you know I, I think that can be helpful, but it's also going to raise questions. Mm -hmm. And then John perhaps can talk about the uh, the customs of as they developed in the Anglican tradition. Yeah, I can't see you guys. I'm trying to fix this thing back here. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. We can hear you. We can even see you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, can, I can't even see myself. I mean, this, I don't know. This thing puts an ad up here, and I'm trying to get rid of it, but I don't want to. Uh, here we go. Maybe this will bring it back. Uh, this is so annoying, you know, when you get something up here. I don't know how to. I don't know how to fix this. Yeah. Uh, uh, so annoying. We, we, we learn, I think we learn through dealing with surprises. Yeah, exactly. Right. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to get out of this. Uh, Zoom has put an ad up here. Huh. Uh, oh. Yeah. What is the ad for? Is it for Zoom? Yeah, I, I don't wanna, I wanna get out of it, so. I'll look have, for a little, a little back. X somewhere. Okay, I'm yeah. gonna, I'm gonna right. come back. There was is no X. Here we go. I had, to, I had to get out of it and come back. So I'm, uh, sorry guys. Excuse okay. me. Okay. <laughs> You're okay. 
Okay. I, I need to get ready for our uh, yeah our prayer. Also, I'm doing something in the background here too. Um, my, my wife needed to talk to the gardener, so she was hollering me to get to the gardener. That's what I, you know, uh, the joys of of non celebrate priesthood, you know. <laughs> well, whatever. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, I don't think you have to be celibate or, or non-celibate to deal with a gardener. <laughs> no. Well, I, what I'm saying is I wouldn't have a wife hollering at me to do this, do that, or the other thing, you know? Well, if not her, if not her somebody else, maybe. Well, yeah, the pastor. Well, what I find... <laughs> the bishop. Well, or there are multiple yeah. levels of women in your lives as, as a celibate. For well, all the way true. from the housekeeper and secretary to the heads of various organizations who know know what you're supposed to do better than you know what you're supposed to do. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. I don't think the Catholic Church has any uh, any copyright on that one either. Mm -mm. <laughs> we have the altar guild, you know. Mm -hmm. And then we, then we have the choir, which has been described as the war department. Mm. <laughs> anyway, enough of that stuff. People do get passionate about music. This yeah, is true. Yeah. <laughs> well, Tommy yeah. You should know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I tell you, I uh, I don't know. I commented on somebody's. Uh, they had a picture of, of a, a church with a, what we call happy clapping music. And I said, Tell me this is not a Catholic church. And it was. I think it was, I think Susan posted something from so we had the holy name of Mary, perhaps, that it was uh, and boy, it sure looked like an assembly of God operation to me. But anyway, I'm very stuffy and I like the old traditional music. So. Well, so do I. I mean, you know, my my choir days were, you know, it was a music lesson for sure, because I had, you know, along with scripture, because you know, we, we had some really good choices. And so now when I go to these other churches, I, this praise and worship thing they do all the time just drives me nuts. Mm -hmm. It drives me nuts too, because it's so fatuous and, you know, simplistic. Yeah. But oh. It, 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 it floats some people's boat, but it certainly doesn't float mine. Mm -hmm. No, and I, you know, and with all due respect, it's so heavily weighed with like Jesus is my savior that it just like, you know, reeks of, you know, that, that whole thing that I just go. My okay. personal savior. Yeah, my personal say. Yeah, well, they don't actually sing that, but they say. Too bad it, about know. the rest of you, but he's my, but he's done great things for me. <laughs> yeah, <we're not. laughs> yeah, me and God, that's the old pietistic stuff, you know. Yeah. No, well. Okay. My dad always said, you know, if you want any action, you got to go to the top. So I always go to God before I go to Christ. Yeah, like I always ask for the manager in a store, right? Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, so. It's going to be very interesting when we do discuss the Eucharist, but that's next week, right, Tom? I think so, because I, I'm, I'm suffering from a little bit of lack of time to send out the things that I would like to um, uh, see uh, people become a little familiar with and, and be the focus of our discussion. Because yeah. the stuff that Denise, God bless her, sent out uh, from the Archdiocese of Denver and you know got one of the arch conservatives there uh, Aquila, uh, it's it's good stuff, but it's one sided. And what I what I find with uh, the the distressing thing is that even Bishop Barron, whom I generally like and and admire, even though he you know he's not so much an evangelist as he is an apologist. And uh, and there's room for apologists, but his stuff on the Eucharist is almost totally focused on uh, the real presence. You know that all you have to do is 
is affirm that the bread is no longer bread and the wine is no longer wine. They are the body and blood of Christ really and truly present there through uh, the uh, philosophical, shall we say, process of transubstantiation. That explains it all. You just believe that and you know everything you need to know about the Eucharist. Well, no, there's, there's a little bit more than just the personal contact with Jesus because he is really present there. And our current um, teaching and preaching on the Eucharist doesn't capture the fullness of our, of our tradition when it, when it comes to kind of trying to unfold that, the, the fuller dimensions of presence. Tom, um, have you, or Janice, have you seen um, uh, Barron's book? on the Eucharist, it's, just, it's a very, you know it, I got it. I, yeah. it I, I, I got it too, I read it and then I, I realized that this is one of the early things that he wrote probably 10 or 12 years ago. Ah, I see. Yeah, I have a copy but I haven't looked at it yet. It's a very Slightly book. updated. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, he's not one of my favorite people so I don't really follow oh, really? him at all. No. Is he is he too right for you or too right wing? Oh yeah, way too right. And, is that and, right? And, he, you know, and surprisingly, I say this to everybody, he comes from the same suburb of Chicago that I do, which is really surprising. Yeah, so, you think uh -huh. it'd be interesting. But you know, it was fabulous. He started off saying, you know, uh, giving um, applauds to Bishop Sheen, you know, Fulton Sheen, and uh, that um, sort of seeing himself in that same role, but, you know, updated, not with the drama and all that. And um, I like I like a lot of his stuff. I mean, but you know, he does quote Anglican authors. He quotes N.T. Wright, and he loves N.T. Wright. I mean, he, yeah. he was, you know, he's a, a, a British scholar, became a bishop of Durham, and he had enough of the episcopate after, you know, two weeks. And, you know, he, you know, he said, I don't want to be a diocesan bishop. I want to go back to writing books. And, but he's, he's, he's in our Anglican um, uh, house. He's considered very right wingish too. Um, so when when I when I saw that he likes N.T. Wright, first of all, I was amazed that a Roman Catholic bishop is going to, you know, have as one of his heroes an Anglican bishop. Well, um, the other thing is another one of his heroes, and old age has robbed her name from my consciousness right now. But uh, the very famous uh, woman priest um, theologian preacher um oh i know who you mean um yeah uh, i'm uh, fleming rutledge fleming, fleming rutledge. rutledge yeah uh, he's uh, very enamored of her yeah i know that was um, to me that was very progressive and i like that i mean and mm -hmm. he quotes other quotes protestant authors we're not yeah. protestants but i mean you know he's an interesting guy he's an interesting guy the, the you know the other thing is he puts a he puts too much of a wall of separation between the between the um, oh no what do we what do we call them the, the the group of theologians past the the council who were sort of in the uh, adjournamento field the uh, the updating uh, Rahner and Skillebex Skillebex. and Kung yeah. and those yeah. and. As a hard and fast division between De Lubac and mm -hmm. um, uh, Yves Congar, Congar, and and uh, what what's the other one? Who's also one of my favorites? Um, uh, well, anyway, the, yeah. the 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 one the resource month the resource month and adjournamento people yeah. he, he puts a strong he line of division between and he them. says where he is he, he makes it very clear which side he's on and you know and, and i think that it's a yin, yin and yang thing you need to you know basically we we can't lose touch with our tradition we have and the, the whole the whole basis of the reform has been going back to mine the the pre-medieval tradition Mm -hmm. the the ancient church to see what that has 
to say to us, apart from the medieval uh, scholastic interpretation of the ancient church. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. uh, and, you know, he, 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 he introduces, I think, a false dichotomy there. But you know, this whole thing was that he grew up, you know, he's, he's way younger than I am, and he grew up as a kid. Me too. You know, I mean, yeah, I know. You and I are roughly the same. Yeah, me too. <laughs> but I mean, I mean, the, the point is that he grew up as a kid in this, what I would call a wasteland yeah. uh, in the Catholic Church which in America, right after the council, where, where everything, yeah. you know, you know, anything goes kind of. A happy, thing. clappy, but... And yeah, but, but it was it was it was the thinnest, uh, most diluted, you know, form of of what I'd grown up with as a kid. I'm old, a little older than you, Tom, but I mean, I grew up with the last. I was mass. going to point that out. <laughs> but I mean, the the whole point is, you know, he he came to grips with this as a brilliant guy. You know, he was he was always brilliant, and he said, "Wait a minute, you know, where we threw out the baby with the bathwater." Yeah. And. Yeah. I was saying that years ago, and that's yeah. part of the reason why I, you know, swam the Tiber, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, it's it's very interesting. But he he didn't grow up in that era as a, a young man, and I was in my twenties when that was happening, mm -hmm. and um, when the council was happening, and uh, I hated the fact that the stuff was thrown out, and, and and all that richness that I grew up with, trained by Jesuits, if you will. And the best of the best, you know that that really was sort of out, and now he's trying to reclaim it. And I yeah. think he's got. Yeah. And, and you know, unfortunately, what I think has happened is they they rescued the baby from the bathwater and then embalmed it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. But uh, here comes Kathy. Oh, good. But no, I mean, he does okay. have redeeming qualities. And I, I think I, I listened to, I think, Tom, one of the links you sent that I was really Hi surprised there. that he Hi, did. Hi, Kathy. Hi there. I think he's evolved. So, uh, you know, hopefully he'll evolve a little more. Hi, Kathy. Hi there. How are you? Well, unfortunately, I see him having evolved somewhat in the more uh, institutional, maybe somewhat traditionalist way. We're talking about uh, Bishop Barron, but we need to get uh -huh. off of Bishop Barron yeah, before we all get onto Facebook because yeah. it is that time. Okay. Before we go on Facebook, Father Tom, yeah. can I ask you guys a favor? Yes. Can you say a prayer for my brother who is, are we on Facebook yet? No, not yet. Oh, who is, uh, who's actually have a, has a court appearance. He was involved in a hit and run. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't mind saying a prayer for him and for the people who were injured. Okay. Thank you. Uh, why don't, be, you know, when I go into the prayer, which I'm going to put up on the screen again uh -huh. from, uh, from Plow, uh -huh. uh, would you mention asking that prayer intention? Okay. And we may also, you know, want to include as our prayer intention, all of those who, of our own family and friends and uh, associates and circle of whatever who have died. Okay, thank you. What's your brother's name, Kathy? Marvin, 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 Marvin. Jr. Yeah, Marvin that was your Jr. father's name too, right? Yes, yeah. yes, he was Marvin Sr. Okay, I'm, I'm going to push the live on Facebook button now. And uh, go live. So, um, anything else we need to talk about among ourselves? No, it's very interesting. I mean, I, you know, my, my cousin passed away just a few weeks ago and I just happened to be in Chicago um, so this is very poignant and, you know, sort of right on the money. And I haven't done, I didn't do any of the readings because I was too busy yesterday, but I'll have to look back at what you sent, mm. Father, and just kind of take a look at it. But it's very interesting to hear because, you know, I even think back, you know, a couple of years ago, my dad passed away and just thinking about the order of, you know, what it all means because we don't often think mm -hmm. about it. 
Mm-hmm. So, and because, you know, my brothers and sisters and that, you know, most of them are not practicing. I'm the only one. So it's sort of like, mm-hmm. you know, I don't have a lot to say. And mm-hmm. oftentimes, mm-hmm. So. You know, it's interesting. I, I, I picked up on that book, The Ars Moriendi, The, the Art of Dying. Mm. Um, and th- this guy is was an MD before he joined the Dominicans. Right. Uh, Columba Thomas, uh, using the term brother, I don't know whether that's just, you know, before he gets ordained a priest or if he's a permanently a, a, a brother. And that. I, I don't know. What yeah, that I, I, I don't know either. But it's an interesting, interesting thing because he um, translated this this book, the Ars Moriendi, which was done in the fifteenth century in, in Middle English, mm-hmm. and it was written by a guy by the name of William Caxton, C A X T O N, which is very interesting. He there's a lot of Caxton manuscripts that I've had to do with mm-hmm. in my own scholarly work. Um, but the whole point of the thing, why that was, I think, it was in Crooks or in one of those. Uh, uh, news, crooks. Uh, crooks, yeah, yeah. Uh, is that in 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 those days uh, there weren't that many priests that were available and people were dying left right and center yeah. so they couldn't get the sacraments they couldn't get anything and how similar that is to the covid thing uh, where you know episcopal priests as well as roman priests wanted to go in to, to give essentially in this case clearly mm-hmm. the last rites because the people were dying right. and they couldn't do it and they um in one case, I, I think I, I don't know where I was, I think maybe a Catholic source where they gave the, a nurse the, um, the, the oils, the, the, the um, you know, oleum informorum, uh, and uh, the nurse then anointed the, the person. And some bishops said, well, that's not valid because the priest didn't do it. But we wouldn't say that. I mean, we would accept that because the, the oil's the oil. And I still believe ex opere operato. Uh, you know, it works by itself. You don't have to. But anyway, be that as it may, people really, and, and our priests hated this, that they couldn't connect, you know, with with the people, you know, and that presence and the touch is so important in the healing uh, process. And so it, I think this guy who, who picked up on this and translated it, uh, I, I haven't gotten the book yet. I really want to. Um, I, it's got to be a lot of stuff in there. How do we bring the the nurture the sacraments the church the presence the healing touch how do we bring that when we can't when there is a pandemic and and we're lay ministers uh, and deacons as well as uh, presbyteral can't do it i mean we have to stay outside yeah right 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 well and you know what you know john you just mentioning you know back in you know, and when the book was written and that too, and you're thinking that there's a lack of priests and people are dying with all the plagues that they had going on in Europe at the time. Obviously, I never thought about it, but they were probably overwhelmed as well. And, you know, what what did they do? You know, it's an interesting question. Well, yeah, and uh, there is a very interesting, um, almost, almost, delightful uh, program from the uh, Great Courses mm. on the Black Death. Mm. And I'm, I've been a big fan of the Great Courses, which is interesting. Much of their stuff is now available by a, uh, an open subscription costing $200 a year. Mm. But you can um, avail yourself of all of these courses, which they were usually selling for something like without a discount to the $300 uh-huh. individually. But wow. it's, it's a, I think a 24 uh, session course on the Black Death. Uh-huh. By, mm, I can't remember her name. She is a marvelous scholar and a wonder. And, and a, a, I'll, I'll try to look that up and send, send it to you. But okay. You know, within that history, there there were you know, outstanding examples of um, of uh, clergy being uh, uh, heroically attending the dying, but there were more examples of clergy and the church simply abandoning 
abandoning their parishes, abandoning their their locations and 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 all of that, or of themselves, uh, if they were attending to the dying, you know, they would uh, catch it. They would succumb to it before many of their parishioners did. Yeah. And with the sheer numbers, where you know up to fifty percent of the people of Europe died within uh, five years or so there, and the fact that the plague continued to recur periodically right. throughout Europe, that, that uh, probably the origin of this Ars Moriendi you know, was basically in conjunction with the Black Death. Mm. Because uh, we're talking about the, the, what is it, late 1400s? Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay, yeah. and it was in the mid 1300s that the first wave of the mm -hmm. of the Black Death hit Europe so hard. It looks like we're in for a continuing pandemic too, when you have all these Delta variants and this variant and that variant, and you know people are sort of perpetually wedded to their masks. You know, mm -hmm. as much as you know, I'm I'm, I'm done with masks. I hate them, but I mean, you got to do it, and you right. know, and I'm cool with with doing it. But I mean, are we going to be masked? people for, you know, for the foreseeable future. It, it's like the, there's no cure for this. Right. Well, yes and no. You know, I, the best that I've been able to read is that eventually, when you get enough people vaccinated, of course, that's the other question. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it, it is going to happen. It took, what, three, three years or more for the flu after 1918 to get to the point where it simply became a part of uh, a part of our lives and as the fluid vaccines developed that you know we deal with it through regular vaccination that's probably what's going to happen with with covid yeah but you know i was just but there COVID. there then are other you know, what they're afraid of is, okay, something new, a, no, a novel virus right. may, uh, right. you know, we can still be very susceptible to um, something else, mm -hmm. uh, achieving pandemic status. Right, because there's a point where the infection of the virus too, if there aren't enough people to infect, it, it gradually dies out as well. So there's a double, I mean, once you get the herd immunity and, you know, if that happens, so enough people are vaccinated or they have the immunity from having had it, it gradually dies out. But then again, then you have this new thing where there might be something else that comes that we're not immune to. And, you know, it, this, the cycle starts all over again. Yeah. And, like and of course, Europe. you know, we, we've got a, a couple of... Um... Uh, examples of this in the relatively recent past within the last, I don't know, uh, 10, 20 years or so, uh, widespread vaccination has completely eliminated smallpox. Mm -hmm. mm. Right. And right. Um, through the promotion of widespread vaccination, uh, polio is on right. its way to be eliminated. Right. But we, we've never had a, a, a situation before uh, where you have a political overtone to this thing. And that unfortunately has infected, and, and I, no pun intended, right. but, but it's infected so many people. I was astounded to hear that one third of, I believe it was the police force in one of the largest cities. Yeah. Uh, well, know. that was the part of my family, you know, my father's brother's part of the family where one of them was an ex police and in Chicago in Schaumburg and you know his brothers weren't vaccinated one's in Florida and the other one that passed away worked for the city of Schaumburg and they mm -hmm. were all not they're all not vaccinated but after he passed away boy they sure you know I mean my other cousin that yeah. that is their brother that lives out in uh, you know in Palm Desert he just railed them up and up and down about it and you know and then I put my two cents in and sure enough, at the memorial, they they said, you know, please, everybody get vaccinated, you know. Well, yeah. a little too late, you know. Yeah, locking in the barn door after the horse is up. Yeah. Right, well, right. 
Well, it you will know, be it's, interesting it's, how this plays out in the short term. In the long term, uh, you know, it will simply become the virus will stay with us and it'll be something similar, I think, to the flu. Right. Yeah. You know, the, I, Which another, kills an awful lot of people every year. Right, right, right. But one point is just the rhetoric that people use. Like my neighbor, I went, you know, I passed her by one day and we were talking and she goes, oh, well, you know, my, my company now is forcing me to get vaccinated, you know, uh. blah, blah, blah. and she goes, well, yeah, my parents came from, you know, came from the Netherlands. And when they came here, I mean, this is the rhetoric, they were forced to be vaccinated with all these vaccines before they got into the US, you know, before they could mm -hmm. come in. Well, I mean, nobody thought that in the past. They right. just did mm -hmm. it. It's like, you know, if I go to India, I need vaccinations. If I go to Africa, I need vaccinations. And right. these, this idea of using the rhetoric now of like, I was forced yeah, it. well, that's yeah. because a certain person whose name will not be mentioned raised this up and out of the woodwork came all these people that, it, you know, that are just, you know, it's my right and it's this rugged individualism, which is part of our American culture, unfortunately. Right. You know, and so it's uh, it's a killer, you know, I mean, it, it literally. Yeah. Uh, but it, it's really, um, I've got to call her, i got to take. Hello. Well, shall we continue this as we, uh, right. the, 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 this may or may not be a relevant topic for some kind of future uh, consideration, but. Yeah, exactly. Let's, let, let's us say goodbye. <laughs> yeah, goodbye, Tom. Okay. Goodbye, John. Goodbye, Jan. Goodbye, John. Goodbye, everybody. God bless. Have a good Bye -bye. week.